so that you're getting fed uh, fed what the executive want to tell you really. So as a, as a non-exec director, you have to be inquisitive and you have to demand to know uh, where are the assets? What are we doing with these assets? What controls have we got in place? How do I achieve oversight to get a unified view of the business? Because everybody wants to come and talk to me about their silo. Uh, and, I, and you don't often get joined up business thinking. And how is the business actually performing? Uh, because most senior managers want to go in there and tell you everything is good. Uh, so it's tough. So let's go to the next slide, Kim. Um, the first thing I think a board needs to do, actually, before they even get to risk management, uh, is to really be uh, quite clear about the vision um, of the company. And a lot of businesses are getting into this now, uh, but not everybody's there. So what do you want to be as a company? What are the outcomes uh, that you're looking to achieve? Um, and for me, a vision is a combination of, firstly, the mission and the common purpose of the company. Uh, and getting agreement to that is terribly important, uh, because if you don't have an alignment across the board of what you're there to do, then it's unlikely that you're actually going to achieve something. And then the second piece is looking at the strategy and agreeing what the business model is. And when I'm talking about the business model, it's more than just the value chain of inputs uh, activities, outputs, and outcomes. The business model needs to look at each of the assets that a business actually relies on. And certainly, if you ask you know, the CFO what are the assets of the company, uh, he or she will probably reach for the balance sheet and point to some numbers. Um, it's, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's, it's also the reputation and the relationships of uh, the company and the partners that the company has uh, in, a, in what is... Uh, obviously a joint endeavor with many businesses. Uh, but it's also the IP the company has. It could be the data, the systems the company has, uh, all sorts of things, including obviously the people uh, and how engaged they are. So looking at the business model in the round is a very important thing. And clearly it does then uh, uh, align to the value chain of the company. But we also know, uh, don't we, that Actually, the biggest barrier to success, I think, is culture, uh, or the biggest accelerator to success can be culture. So very important. And culture is a word that's banded around, but actually, I think you need to go deeper. You need to really revisit the values uh, that are at the core of, of culture and understand how, how those translate into the behaviors of your corporation. Uh, the behaviors are actually what uh, people see uh, and they can call them out, whereas a value is everybody signs up to them. But you do need to start there. But what sort of behaviours do you want your stakeholders, stakeholders to see in your people as they go around uh, their everyday business? And to get to that, actually, you also need to touch on ethos. And ethos is really about what do you believe in? You know, do you believe you're in business to make money? Do you believe you get up in the morning to sell products or services? Or do you believe in something greater than that, uh, something more aligned to what effect you're trying to have on customers, certainly end users, uh, but also your, your business partners, the people involved in actually making your brand come alive. So very important vision. It, it's a, an opportunity to align all the stakeholders around an idea. And it has to, in the end, be very simple. So if we click on then, Kin, to the next slide, um, it is about, you know, what do we want to achieve over the long term? It's growing people. It might be developing operational excellence. It's delivering those stakeholder outcomes. It's stewardship, delivering today, of course, uh, but also taking care of all of those assets under your charge over the long term. And ultimately, that is the responsibility of a board director. And it can be measured in the reputation, the level of trust, admiration, and esteem that people have in the corporate brand. Ultimately, you only get your financial success when your stakeholders are satisfied. If you don't have the support of your stakeholders, uh, over time, you'll see your financial performance diminish. Uh, but don't think you can have a dash for cash. Uh, it's not sustainable. 
So if we click over, Kin. I think also uh, it's important for somebody on the board to understand there's a couple of big things they're in charge of. The first is um, making sure they understand the uncertainties that can impact their vision, uh, impact the aims of the company, and they, all of those need to be properly managed proactively to increase the probability of success. And I think that needs to be done at three very distinct levels. And you can break these up. I'm, some companies break them up into five levels, but certainly strategic and governance go together. And that's very much managing, managing within the board uh, those things that might change what you do as a business and who has the power uh, to make decisions and how is that disseminated throughout the company. Uh, the second level is the financial and tactical layer. And this is usually all about change management and performance uh, in, in terms of the money uh, and large projects in the company. And then the third level is the operational and compliance level. And obviously, a more regulated business uh, will split that out. But uh, making sure you comply with the societal uh, norms and expectations, but also making sure you're operating efficient, efficiently and effectively. Uh, so that can be a top-down and a bottom-up. I think most people are familiar with that. Um, but the second big uh, issue there, I think, for the board to make sure is happening well in their company is that you know, the issues, the incidents, and the crises are really understood and embraced. Uh, issues that are out there, you know, if, if people are unhappy with you as a, a brand and a company, uh, there's nothing quite like actually getting a grip of it uh, and doing something about it. And I, I think, uh, John, just to chip in there, some of the big corporate failures we've seen in recent times have been that those organisations have not understood the incidents and yeah. managed the crisis, don't, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, if you think, go back to what I was saying about the reports and the papers, when I sit on a board, I, I groan when I get 18 inches of paper land on my desk to read over the weekend. Uh, you know, it is the executive telling me what they think I, I should hear. And of course, their natural bias is to tell me good news. Um, you've always got to be inquisitive as a board member and ask about what are the issues? What are people worried about? Why are they unhappy? Or why do they like us? Uh, what incidents have happened? What can that, you know, is it a leading edge indicator? Just because it didn't end in a disaster, it could be a near miss. Or what lessons can we truly learn from crises that happened? You know, and that takes time and it takes reflection. Um, you can't just go, oh, yeah, that went well. Maybe we could have done a comms better. You know, you, you really need to think about crises and incidents and issues and, and decide what are you going to do about it? Why did it arise and what are you going to do about it? Um, and it probably means that you've got to change some behaviors, change your, your controls, your plans uh, to make sure that uh, we learn. And you've got to turn, turn your organization into a learning organization. And that is fundamentally, I think, what a board director is, is there to do. So let's click on, Kin. So I think um, the board director then needs to say, right, OK, I understand. I've got you know, strategic, tactical, operational and compliance stuff out there that I need to manage probably more effectively than I do at the moment. Um, and I think the job there is to resource the uh, senior management and, and appoint the senior management to go and build capability and go and build discipline and self-control within the company and self-awareness. Um, and I think that's going to be different for the different layers of risk management. So at a strategic level, yes, it's about what might affect our vision and aims you know, and what risks are inherent within our business model. Yeah, so what, what do we need to really watch out for? And a non-exec, they, are they really going to understand that just by turning up three times a year? So I think t they need to really get under the skin of the organization to understand uh, the inherent risks. At a tactical level, it's obviously the business plan. You know, everybody's got a business plan. Hopefully they've got a three-year plan, uh, maybe more. Uh, but that's all about monitoring that and giving proper time to reflect how well we're, how well we're doing. And I think that's quite simple, really. It's sort of what's going well and what could go better. 
but get inquisitive about the second, what could go better. Um, get into uh, the, the financial performance, but also the outcomes for all the stakeholders. And that's not going to come to you in a board paper. You know, you need to go out there and listen, listen to the staff, listen to the customers, listen to the suppliers. It's amazing what they'll tell you if you only go and listen. And these risks often link to the operational and compliance requirements as well. Um, so just think things through as they cast, cascade down. And, and I guess, John, it's quite a, you know, you sit as a, as a director uh, yourself. It must be quite difficult to draw that line between exercising your responsibility as a director and, and not and resisting the temptation, if you like, to run the business. Absolutely. It's quite a fine line, isn't it, that yeah. you walk between the two. And you have to sort of just rem remind yourself before you go and talk to people, you know, you're not there to tell them what to do today. Um, you're there to listen, to understand. And you have to ask, it, it's the questioning, you know, you ask three times to really get under the skin and you just thank people and, and, and tell them they're doing you know, a good job, whatever, and, and then go back to the boardroom where you have your discussions, and that's where the decisions are made. Yeah, you're not a manager. That's a huge difference. Especially in a crisis. Especially in a crisis. <laughs> I've seen companies come to grinding halts because the board tried to manage a crisis. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, you, they leave, it to the, leave things to the executive. Um, so uh, an operational... Uh, risk is, is really about efficient, efficiency and effectiveness at the end of the day. Um, it does link down to compliance risks, uh, but really I, I'd like to see compliance as a byproduct really of, of doing a great job at an operational level. I think if, if a board is sitting there uh, just looking at the regulator thinking, what, what have I got to do, then they're really underperforming. Um, I, I like to check. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm complying with the regulations uh, in a structured and calendarized way. I don't want to be, I certainly don't want the executive uh, completely focused on compliance. I want them focused on running a great business for our stakeholders. Um, okay, Kin, let's click on. So strategic risk management, let me just focus on that. I'm gonna give uh, tactical and operational a bit of a buy today because um, I think most of our listeners actually know very well how to do that. I think strategic risk management is the bit that we're, uh, people are grappling with. Um, and my view is it's, it's all about informing the vision, protecting the vision, and championing the vision. Um, and, and so that's why it's so important for a board to actually know what its vision is in the first place and hammer that out in excruciating detail. And hopefully it's really simple at the end of it. If you can't write it down on a piece of A4, then it ain't, it ain't gonna be communicated well and it's not gonna be understood. So the board should spend a lot of time on the vision, but then the directors surely are champions of that. Um, so it's identifying the stakeholders and check their needs, check their perceptions, check their understanding of what the company's about. Be aware of the gap between the, you know, what we think we'd like the vision to be, uh, you know, uh, versus the actual reality. And that's why you have to go and listen to the stakeholders because there is a gap. I used to call it the corporate brand shadow. And there's a gap between how we think we're performing and what our stakeholders might, how maybe the shareholders feel we should be performing. It might be on customers and innovations. They might not like our products and services or why do they like our products and services? Um, it might be the workforce and how they feel about how they're treated. Um, or it could be uh, how people feel uh, we're doing in terms of corporate social responsibility. Uh, there's, any, there's any numbers of, of areas that you have to focus on. Um, and there will be gaps between what people would like to see and what they actually see. And of course, you can benchmark that uh, if you go into reputation management across your stakeholders, across your different markets. Uh, uh, and, and truly understand where you're um, under strength or, or doing really well. Um, the next thing, once you've understood that, is actually integrating or prioritizing the changes that you need to make and integrating them into your business plan. So it's not just the sort of business plan at the board level. Um, it also needs to go into the financial plan, the people plan, uh, the products and the marketing plan, the products and services development plan. You know, all of the planning that goes on in a company throughout the year 
needs to link up and it needs to come back to the delivery of the vision. Um, and then uh, the job of the board is to oversee the management process. You know, don't just fire and forget and tell the, the chief executive to go off and run the business and I'll see you in a couple of years time. It's actually um, the, the advice, the coaching that you can give to the executive, uh, the CEO, but also the management team on how things, um, how things are going. Okay, Kim, shall we click on? So fundamentally, the job, I think, of the risk manager is to identify the risk to the strategic aims in light of the changes to the environment. And I think the board directors, again, can help that process. So it shouldn't just be the, the, the risk director doing it. I think the board are there because they come from other worlds, typically, uh, and they bring expertise and knowledge. They understand how the world is, is shifting. Uh, so they can, they can uh, actually help. And I think for risk managers, that's, that's important to understand. So how many of our risk managers actually go and talk to the directors and say, okay, uh, we understand the vision you've given us. Here are the risks. What do you think you know, about these? How do you see the environment changing? What do you think I should worry about? Where would you like me to go and explore and become more inquisitive? Um, and then I think it's about, once you get your list of concerns, it's about assessing those risks and uh, agreeing how you might uh, um, have come up with different strategies um, to, to mitigate those things. And then once you've got your, your major risk review and you're with your emerging risks, it's about um, checking really that these things are going to uh, adapt the company uh, so that we're adv naturally advantaged in the future. That's a big thing to ask. It's not just about stopping what happened, go wrong yesterday, stopping it. It's actually about, you know, is, is my risk management plan actually going to make my organization fit for the future, given what I know about the external environment, given what I know about the plans for the company? Where does it want to go? Who does it want to... To, to, to do business with? Yeah, what new products and services is it, is it going to introduce? That's a great way, John, of articulating the upside of risk, which I think people find so difficult. We know risk is not just about prevention, yeah. but it's about release of or conversion of opportunity. Yeah. But I do think people struggle sometimes to actually see that positive side of risk, don't yeah, you? Absolutely. It's about enabling the board and the senior exec to succeed in their ambitions. Where do they want to go? What do they want to be? Yeah. And then I think it's also about making sure that your risk plan is going to help the business win competitively. Yeah. The board meeting and the exec senior executive meetings are all about how do, we, how do we adapt for the future and how do we win? How do we beat the competition? So how many of our risk directors actually have that in mind when they go in and present to the board? Or are they going into the board and saying, oh, I'm in charge of this risk and this is how we're doing? Mm. Yeah. So I think before you go into your next board meeting, really think about the journey the non-exec and uh, the, the, the chairman is on. You know, what are they trying to achieve? What are they worried about? What they should be worried about? You know, are you helping them build a future for tomorrow? Are we beating our competition? Are we naturally advantaged? Are we delivering the experience our stakeholders want? Yeah, trust is about reputation. Yeah, it's trust, admiration, and esteem. Trust is the one everybody focuses on, and usually it's a lack of trust we're talking about. But how many of your companies know how, how well loved they are by the stakeholders? Why they're loved by the stakeholders? So I think it's a different mindset to uh, to, to probably what we've traditionally been walking into the boards uh, with. And I think um, the other point there is obviously you're going to take the board through how you're doing on mitigating some of the, the high net risks they're worried about. Um, so the current risk level. And you want to be able to give the board either assurance over, over those risks or tell them that actually, you know, I'm sorry, we're not doing enough. And it's about confronting the brutal facts. Uh, it's about um, being honest with them. Don't conceal stuff. But what you need to do if you're going to do that is obviously take the executives who are in the room with you 
So don't don't turn up at the board and uh, fire off a load of loose cannons because that's just going to be uh, destructive. Um, you have to almost get the executives to say actually they would like to talk about this. Yeah. So the IT director actually talking about maybe he hasn't got enough budget or enough time or he's understood some new vulnerability uh, rather than you having to deliver the, uh, the, the, the bad news. Okay, Kin, if we click on. And then lastly, really, um, uh, or lastly, I think I want to just talk about the three lines of defense. I know a lot of people want to have five, six, seven lines of defense, but actually keep it really simple in my book. Um, I think the board director absolutely is on the hook for making sure the company's got a really robust three lines of defense model, making sure the first line of defense, the operators, understand their roles and responsibilities, you know, making sure HR has got all of the risk management responsibilities in their, in their job description. When they sign off the competency agreement for the company, you know, that risks, it's risk cognizant, it's, it's risk aware, so that the reward uh, systems also can be designed so that people get rewarded for being responsible. Um, and that obviously, that sort of thing is in the second line for HR. So the policies and the processes, but making sure the first line people are risk aware that they're trained and the right culture is in there is really important. Second line of defense is obviously, you know, the policy makers, the strategy uh, writers. And third line, as you know, is all about uh, the internal audit, external audit. Getting so, so I guess the second line, John, is the heart of enterprise risk management, isn't it? Absolutely. For that to be co-joined yep. is really what ERM is all about, isn't it? Totally. So when I, when I was doing this, I, I very much saw myself as the sort of the conductor of the second line, really. Yeah. You know, um, that, was, that was primarily what you were there to do, making sure yeah. the business is joined up and one department isn't dragging it off in one direction that actually is undermining another department. And we, we know that the three lines of defence, I mean, it's much more rigorous in terms of application within financial institutions and it's either a Vegemite or a Marmite model to some people but I think um, we know the Institute of Internal Auditors are sort of uh, having a bit of a rethink about this model themselves but e even in their consultation it's really much more about how the model is used than whether or not the model is robust and is useful yeah. I think. Yeah absolutely. So let's move on to the last slide, Kin, for me, before I hand over to Julia. Uh, so, so risk management, if you like, or ERM is, is done. We've done the strategic bit. Um, one of the things that I think risk managers also need to really embrace, and I touched on it earlier, is you know, managing issues, incidents, and crises. So for crisis management, it is absolutely imperative that risk managers uh, embrace uh, crisis management for common foreseeable in, uh, issues in the, in, in the company. Um, they're probably the high impact um, uh, and low probability things or, or even high probability. Um, it's threats and vulnerabilities that the company has. Um, and it's, it's really important that everybody thinks these things through. Uh, you do scenarios on them and you test your controls. Uh, and you have joined up thinking. And if you can actually bring together groups of people in the organization uh, to almost rehearse your crisis plans uh, across functionally, on the day of the races, when it all goes horribly wrong, things will go so much better. Crisis management is like a little muscle. And if you exercise it, it gets stronger and stronger. And if you're good at it, as you all know, um, you'll actually come out of the crises in better shape than when you went in. So uh, that's, that's really uh, where I wanted to go. I think uh, the other last point there on emerging issues is that don't forget to do crisis management for those emerging issues, because those might be the ones that really catch you out. Uh, if you don't understand the risk yet, and you've got to manage a crisis on something you really don't understand, it could be tricky. So that's, that's I think, uh, my, my last point on that. Um, before I hand over to, to Julia, because I think the next piece here is that um, managing risk in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the current climate where technology, we're in the fourth industrial re uh, revolution, uh, is really taking it on again. And there are some things that I think boards will struggle with. OK, 
Okay, thanks, John. Um, so we, we've got um, just over halfway through the presentation here, and uh, we will leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and we've got this far in the presentation, and we haven't actually mentioned the word risk register yet. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is quite intentional, because really it, managing risk in the age that we're in and progressing through is really trying to get on the boardroom table the things that really matter. Um, I think we should take as a given that organizations are going to look at their principal risks, and they're going to form risk registers, and many regulators insist that you do that, in fact. But actually, in, in the digital age, what you've got to be looking at are what, what's going to uh, keep us awake at night and, and what might threaten our existence. And that could be as, as low as two or three key things which you really want the board to explore in the precious time that they give you um, to look at risk. So um, we're going to spend a couple of slides here looking at the context of this new world. And this first slide, um, as well as a shameless plug, uh, for a piece of research that uh, we published at AIRNIC, um last year and then a boardroom edition of this research this year, which looked at the world of resilience in the digital age, um, has got some very um, important messages here because that diagram um, at the back of Roads to Revolution is really there for a very important point because it's making the point that in the uh, world that we're welcoming you to today, it is complex, it is changing, and it, importantly, is connected. And therefore, uh, the world that we live in uh, and travel through now is a very different one to the one that we looked at in the past, where perhaps risks were more static, and nothing is going to stay the same for very long in the dynamic world uh, that we're going to be living in um, tomorrow. So, Ken, if you can um, move on to the next stage, there's just a couple of slides that we want to give you a signpost because quite often when we're talking in AMIC about risk, it's um, amazing how often when we say to people, well, do you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer? John's already mentioned the importance of trust. And um, I, I was actually in a, a meeting yesterday at a business school with 25 people who are non-execs or C-suite. And I asked them how many knew about this were um, uh, people who are very senior in their positions. And it, it always makes me surprised that, that this piece of research that's been around for a number of years um, is not that well known. Um, and this particular slide is, is just one extract taken from a very detailed report. Um, the next one is due out in February 2020. Um, but this is absolutely pertinent, pertinent for the subjects that we've been covering today because there's been an 11 point shift in how people within organizations are now looking towards their leadership for direction. Um, and I think in the past, governments were being expected to, to look at things like equal pay. They were being expected to look at issues like environmental issues. And I think in, in the world that we're in today, a lot of employees are saying enough is enough. Governments have failed to deliver these areas. And now, actually, we're looking at our chief executives to take this lead rather than waiting for governments to impose things. And I think it's, it's even bigger than just the employees, actually. It's the whole of society uh, is getting uh, fed up with uh, a lot of the institutions in the world. And they, they expect uh, their companies to really uh, be responsible. Uh, and I think companies can find the cold wind of change come to them quite quickly if they're not. So whether it's their use of plastic or uh, the use of fossil fuels, the people are going to have a, a society is going to uh, rise up against companies more and more now uh, if they do, if they're not cognizant of this. Yeah, and I think um, Edelman used the they use the expression the um, employee and employer contract, which I think is quite a nice um, way of summarising um, the changes that they've seen, because now trust at work really ought to be finding its way onto risk. If you have a risk yes. register, it really ought to be in there somewhere in terms of what your organization's um, attitude is towards this. So Ken, if you can move on to the next slide, this is another context, which is taken from 
the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report. Um, the next one is due out on the 20th of January, so uh, watch this space. Uh, this slide is constructed um, from the report that was published earlier this year. But the reason we put this in there is the emphasis on people issues again. And we actually see a convergence going on between some of the findings of Edelman and some of the findings of the World Economic Forum. And there's, been a, there's a lot of um, knowledge out there in the risk and the technology space on some of the stressors that are changing the way that people and organizations are behaving in that digital age. Um, I'll pick on a couple here. Um, first of all, there is a blurring between work and life. Um, where do you switch off and where do you switch on? Uh, people are now um, being encouraged rather than discouraged these days to uh, be available 24 hours a day. What's the effect on that, on the stressors and the well-being of the people that you manage? Um, are the concerns, we keep saying, well, artificial intelligence won't threaten your job. It will just give you better jobs to do. And I think some of the opinion on that is actually changing a little bit, that people are saying, well, actually it might mean that some of these jobs disappear. And therefore, it's not surprising that employees are worried about this and what the future of that might hold for them and making them feel insecure about their future jobs. So I think when a board is looking at issues associated with risk, they really need to take some of these issues into consideration as a context. So before you start saying, what are the things that should keep us awake at night? look at the issues that Edelman raise and look at the issues the World Economic Forum raise and use that as the context um, that you go through internally and externally before you start considering and assessing risk. So I guess one challenge uh, a risk manager can pose to the, the board, the chairman, the company secretary, is to look at the agenda of board meetings and say, is it all about money? Is the culture of the company about money? Or, or do we care and look after these other assets? like reputation, like uh, employee engagement? Do we really care about uh, our IP and our systems and things like that? Or are we so focused on money that actually we're missing a trick here? Yeah, good point, John. Um, Ken, if you'd like to move on to the next stage. We're, we've got a couple of slides here which are looking at, um, we're all familiar with the principles of resilience, but one of the key things that our research did is it took what I would call now the established principles. We know we need risk radars to tell us what's going on. Uh, John's already uh, talked about that. Uh, the leadership and governance that we need in place, uh, the relationships and networks that we should all be building. He's talked about crisis management, which is rapid response. And of course, you have to review and adapt. Otherwise, uh, in the famous Darwinian principle, um, you're doomed to fail. However, um, oh, and by the way, you have to do all of those things. So you can't, you can't, it's not a pick a mix that you can pick the things you'd like to do. But in the digital age, we've actually added three new principles. Um, the first one is that you've got to redesign your processes and you've got to harness the technology that's out there and convert the opportunities that that technology presents you with. Um, you've got to retain your stakeholders. You've got to make sure that you stay engaged with the people who will help you develop and build your business. And, and as John has pointed out, that's not just employees, that's all of your stakeholders. And then perhaps more importantly, and I think the, the, the one that stands out for us is reinvent your purpose. You know, why are you here today? Um, you're, you're not the Victorian ice company anymore, and you're not making um, old fashioned products and solutions. How do you need to reinvent your purpose to remain pertinent and relevant so that you can achieve the value creation that your organization is there to achieve. Do you, do you want to mention anything else on purpose, John, or shall we move on and expand that? Well, I think uh, the only thing I would say is actually in the digital world, you know, that the, the opportunities to repurpose are huge. You know, there's so many, if you just tweak your purpose slightly, you can absolutely change the opportunity in front of the company who, who yeah. you're talking to, what you can deliver for them. Mm. So this is as much about opportunity. In fact, I think it's more about opportunity yeah. than it is about risk. But obviously, you're not just going to manage the old risks as the company rebuilds. And, and we'll come back and, and sort of give a bit of a health warning on that in a yeah. second. Um, <laughs> so, Ken, if you can move on to the next uh, slide, which is our stopwatch. Now, John's already talked about strategic, tactical and operational risk. 
um, and the focus on strategic ambitions. However, the, there's a bit of a challenge in here because um, typically strategic, uh, tactical and operational risks move at different speeds. So the world that you're living in, the context is, is moving constantly faster. And the business environment that people operate within and businesses operate within is, is typically moving slightly slower. Until you then get to the operational risk, which is the business itself, uh, and no surprise there that it's moving even slower. Um, so one of the things we feel that the risk manager and the risk professional can do is to be the holder of that stopwatch, to be the timekeeper, the person in an organization that can help the organization to synchronize business reactions with external realities. Um, we can't stop the world moving faster, but we can help businesses to keep up with that change and to be nimble and agile. And I think that dynamism and agility is one of the biggest changes in the way that organizations need to approach and manage risk compared to, if you like, some of the more traditional ways of the past. But if we just go on to the next side, um, Ken, because those three additional principles of resilience come back. And, and I don't want to focus and just read through the slide. I just want to turn your eye to the purpose slide. And there's a couple of points here, is that we are always being encouraged to look longer term, but it's hard to do that in the digital age. Um, we're in a world where it's very difficult to be predictive. But there's another key message on reinventing purpose. Do that at your peril um, if you don't cascade that through everything the organization does. And one of the things that we're seeing at Airmic, talking to large organizations particularly, who've decided to reinvent purpose, is that they've had a few false starts. Because if you don't cascade your new purpose and why you exist, right through the core of the company, beyond the board, beyond the C-suite, but into the very essence of what you are and your behaviors and your culture, then it's not gonna work. So taking it from the board to the person with the hard hat, with the digger um, in, in, in the mine, uh, away from the board, um, has got to understand and share why you're changing and what that means for their day-to-day -day work. So, knock, so starting to repurpose is about n knocking over the first domino, really. You've got to then move on to the rest of your vision, your strategy, your culture, uh, your, your, your processes. Everything will change uh, when you repurpose. Absolutely. And, and, and I think we've just got a couple of other quick slides that we're going to show. And the first one of those, Ken, if you move on, is, is about emerging risk. Um, emerging risk is not intangible risk. It, it can be intangible risk, but emerging risk is the monster coming over the hill. And it may be running fast, or it may be creeping along the ground, and it may actually be a risk you already have, but it's changing like a chameleon. So um, emerging risk can be many things, but what we discovered when we, we talked to uh, boards about emerging risk is that not everybody welcomes conversations about them. Um, and not everybody has the courage um, because you need confidence and you need confidence is enabled with, if you've got a grasp of what you're talking about. So typically a good example there is technology. Um, a lot of boards are reluctant to talk about technological risk. They don't understand some of the principles of technology and therefore maybe they lack a little bit of courage to put their hands up and ask questions. Um, can they gain that courage by having a nominated person on the board who takes that responsibility? Our view is probably not. Um, you wouldn't have people on a board who are not financially literate. We think one of the literacies of the, of the digital age is that everybody has to have at least a basic knowledge of, of technology currency, if you like, um, to use that expression. So you've got to look beyond the issues that can be immediately anchored to your business performance. You've got to tease out volatility um, and you've got to be able to look towards the future. And then just moving on to the last slide. Um, okay, so here's some options. And there are three things um, that I'd just like to point your eyes to here. Under finance, um, I think organizations are fairly static in how they set and manage risk appetite. But we've already said that the digital age is far from static. 
So we would challenge organizations that you constantly need to be looking at your risk appetite to ensure the appetite that you've got reflects your purpose. And if you don't, then your risk appetite can act as a, as a drag on your ability to convert those opportunities from your change of purpose. Separately then over under operations, just look at a response to changes in supply chain curve. Your finance team might be saying, yeah, consolidating of manufacturing locations is a great idea. Uh, reducing the number of suppliers in our supply chain is a great idea. But by making that, you're changing the dependencies in your supply chain and pot potentially increasing the profile of risk. And then finally, under strategy, going back to that aligning your culture and your talent with your purpose. So this is a little toolkit that you can use um, to help your boards look at emerging risks rather than saying it's difficult. And we produce this partly because regulators say you've got to do this, but they offer very little guidance on wow. how you go about it. Um, so I think, John, that, that's really pretty much what we wanted to share today. Um, we've seen a couple of questions that have come up. Yeah. Um, one that's, um, John, do you want to sort of pick up the first one there? Well, I was going to look at the second one, actually. I was just talking. Uh, um, one the, Hello, Kim. Well, yes. Uh, before we get cracking with the questions, I'm going to set you, actually, I'm going to set you a challenge. Um, we can only fit in one question, so I'm going to give you each a minute to answer it. And if we go with this question, are there any techniques to help risk managers to scan the environment and identify emerging risks? So that's one minute on the clock per person. If we start with you, John. Well, I think you go listen. Go listen to your stakeholders. You know, it's not a risk management's a team game. It's get out there, go and listen to the customers and see what they're concerned about. And you can do that with uh, using software today as well. Uh, you can listen to sentiment and understand what things are tracking. Typically, an issue will take six months to really uh, to build. Um, so you can you can just actively listen. Go work with comms; they they can help you with those sort of things. Uh, other things is uh, okay, Julia. Yeah, I, I would add to that scenario planning. Um, in my experience, boards love to do what if exercises, and they're fun. And if they're facilitated well, and that's another skill that maybe the risk professional needs to have a think about. Mm -hmm. Can you do this? Do you know how to moderate or do you need to take a friend in with you to the board to do this? And, and we've recently, again, been talking to a couple of members who've been asked to do this exercise. It's always good to have a buddy with you uh, and a champion on the board, by the way, when you do that. But typically, if you've got two or three scenarios and you can do what ifs, um, our experience is that boards love doing that because it's very engaging. Um, and if you keep looking at scenarios, it's a great way to get people to think about some what ifs of what might be coming over the horizon. Excellent, Julia, John, thank you very much for your insight and knowledge. It's certainly given me loads of food for thought. That brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, we will be joined by Hans Lesso, who is the founder of Actus Consulting and former risk manager at the Lego Group who will be talking about how best to implement risk-based decision-making. That will go live at 1 p.m. UK time. Look forward to welcoming you back. Thank you. Thank you.